in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat, facing an attack of the enemy, an invasion of his country, gathers the people together at the temple in Jerusalem. And this is what he says. If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. That was his prayer, part of his prayer to God. Notice that parenthetical, for your name is in this temple. I would like to preach the name is in the house. Amen. The name of Jesus is in the house tonight. Amen. You may be seated. God's name is very significant in Scripture, and I'm preaching a message of victory tonight. We heard Brother Shaw preach this morning on victory over the devil, that we are not ignorant of his devices, but when we understand what he does and his tactics, we can have victory over him in the name of Jesus. So I just come tonight to underscore the fact that we have victory in our church and victory in our lives through the name of Jesus. Praise God. In the Bible, the names are very significant. Sometimes we choose names for our kids without much consideration of their meaning. Sometimes it's mostly because of the sound of the name, or perhaps there is some family connection. But in the Old Testament particularly, uh, parents would think about and even pray about the names that they would choose. And typically, a name would represent, sometimes it would represent the circumstances surrounding the birth of the child. But more often, even, it would uh, represent the spiritual aspirations that the family had for their child. It would extol the greatness of God. It would be a form of praise to Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, It would be incorporating some portion of God's name. And frequently the Bible authors indicate that the name was highly significant in helping us understand the character of that person. And certainly when it comes to God, when God chooses to reveal himself to his people, he uses names and titles that identify his character. So to know God's name is to know something about who he is and what he is like. Not only that, God's name represents his power. That's why when we pray in the name of Jesus, we expect there to be a powerful response. The name also represents authority. When we pray in the name, we recognize we're doing so with God's approval, God's permission. We're coming in his name because he has given us the right to do that. And his name represents his presence because when we invoke his name in faith, we have his attention. And when we have his attention, he hears and answers prayers. What makes the name of God different than all other names? Other names can have significance in part. But because we are finite and limited humans, the name cannot be a full representation. But what makes God's name unique is when we call his name in faith, he is present in power to hear and answer prayer. Praise God. Other names may have power in the human realm. And so in our country, President Obama has authority to sign legislation when he signs his name to a law or when he signs his name to a presidential decree. That carries a lot of power and authority. But he's not everywhere. He can't do all things. And so even that name, as significant as it is right now in American society and government, it's not all powerful. It cannot supply every need. But when you call on God's name, he is always present. He always hears. He always has power. He always has authority. He can always do whatever he needs to do. In the Old Testament, God's name To his people, his supreme name was, we say in English, Jehovah, or in Hebrew, Yahweh. You can see it in the English Bible through the word Lord, all in capitals. That was God's personal name. 
In the New Testament, God is given a new and even greater revelation through the name of Jesus, which literally means Jehovah or Yahweh is Savior. So everything that the Old Testament teaches us about God, all of the meaning, all the power and authority that was invested in that name Jehovah or Yahweh is now invested in the name of Jesus with even greater significance that God was manifested in the flesh. God came into our world. God became one of us without ceasing to be who he was. As a man, he died to pay the price for our salvation, but he rose again by the power of the Spirit. He lives forevermore. And so all the authority and power of God is invested in the name of Jesus. Praise God. It's not a magical formula. Don't, it's not a mechanical thing. In Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John, the apostles, were coming to the temple to pray, a lame man was sitting there begging, and he asked for some money. And they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And they took him by the hand and raised him up, and he began walking and running and leaping and jumping as he was instantly healed by the power of the name of Jesus. That's a good example of what we're talking about. The name of the Lord makes a difference. Crowds of people gathered around marveling. They had seen this man sitting there for years. They were amazed at such a notable miracle and began murmuring and wondering what kind of people could these be? Peter and John, what kind of amazing saints must they be? And so the apostle Peter stood up and he said, Why do you marvel about us and look on us as if by our name, our power, or our holiness we have done this. It's not our great ability. It's not because we're so special, but it's in his name, Acts 3, 16. His name, through faith in his name, has made this man whole. He was healed by Jesus Christ when we called his name in faith. Praise God. And so in our text, this will help us perhaps understand the story just a little bit better. But if you read 2 Chronicles 20, you will find Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, God's people, the southern kingdom, the capital of Jerusalem where the temple of God was. There was a coalition of enemies who came to attack this land of Judah. It was an immense multitude, several nations banded together to attack this one tiny nation. Jehoshaphat realized this was a national crisis, so he gathered people from all over the country. They met in Jerusalem at the temple compound, and he began to pray, and I read a portion of his prayer. He said, God, we need you. We're in a moment of national crisis. And we built this temple for this very purpose that whenever there would be a plague or whenever there would be a famine or whenever there would be an invading army, we would come to this place and pray in your name because we know in this place your name is invoked. Sacrifices are made to your name and we have confidence that your name is in this house. In other words, your attention is here. Your presence is here. Your glory is here. When we come to pray, we know we're going to connect with you. We know we're going to encounter your presence, and we know you will hear and answer. And so he came, and he began to pray this sincere prayer. In verse 12, he in essence says, we are powerless in the face of the enemy. But then he makes this statement, our eyes are upon you. I want you to know, whenever you feel helpless, whenever you feel powerless, and there are times when the enemy is more powerful than we are in our own ability. In fact, that happens quite frequently. It may be circumstances of life. It may be evil people. It may be the devil and his temptations. And in our own flesh, we are not able to withstand But notice the prayer that was so effective. The king said, we are powerless. We don't have the ability, but 
our eyes are upon you. We're looking to you. You are the source of our salvation. I challenge you tonight, look to Jesus. Don't look to your own ability. Don't look to all that you've accomplished. Don't try to depend on what you have done, but depend on Jesus Christ. When we pray and fast, that's not to earn favors with God so that when temptation comes, we say, well, wait, I prayed an hour a day. I prayed 30 minutes a day. I fasted two days, so I'm going to make it. No, that's not the point. That prayer and fasting cultivates a relationship with God. And so when the enemy comes, we don't say, well, look what I've done. Look how much I've prayed. Look how much I've fasted. Look how I'm living a holy life. No, we say, look to Jesus. I know Jesus because, yes, I have been praying. Yes, I have been fasting. Yes, I have been walking with him every day. Yes, I have been listening to his voice. But it's not because of my ability. I'm looking to Jesus. My eyes are upon the Lord. Praise God. That's the source of victory looking to the Lord. And so after he prayed that prayer, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came and the Spirit anointed a prophet in the midst of the people. He stood up and he began to prophesy. And he said, the first part of his prophecy, the battle is not yours, but God's. He says, what you need to understand if you're going to be victorious, the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. So more than focusing on how many weapons we have and how many soldiers we have, how many shields, how many swords, how many spears, our tactics, he said the main thing to understand is you've got to turn this over to God. You'll never be a match for the enemy unless you turn it over to the Lord. But God has a plan that supersedes your plan. God has a purpose that's greater than your purpose. God has wisdom. He's got superior tactics to yours. So you need to let the Lord handle Handle this. And then he went on to say, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, actually, in in Israelite history, most battles it simply records conventional warfare, which I really don't think was God's perfect plan for them, but most of the time they did not rise to the level of what God really wanted. But there are few occasions in Scripture where you find God miraculously intervening and taking care of the battle without really any effort on their part except simple obedience. We see the same words used when Israel crossed the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was coming up behind them. They were in an impossible place. Recently escaped slaves with probably minimal weapons. They were there facing the sea in front of them, behind them the army. They were prey for the enemy. There was no way that a group of slaves recently freed could be a match for the professional army of Pharaoh. But God said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Moses stood at the Red Sea and he proclaimed those very words. Then he stretched out his rod and they The waters parted. They went on dry ground. When Pharaoh and his armies tried to come and follow them, the waters closed and drowned them all. They won a tremendous victory. But notice, they did not really have anything to do with it except trusting in the Lord and doing what God said. And here is another occasion where God said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, there's a time for action, which I'll show you in a minute. But when it comes to fighting against the enemy, you've got to let the Lord direct you. You can't do spiritual warfare with carnal means. That's why when somebody attacks you spiritually, don't attack them carnally. Because you cannot win a spiritual warfare by arguing or fussing or fighting or filing a lawsuit or whatever that may be. You've got to trust in God. Let God do the work. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And from the point of the New Testament, remember I told you 
Jesus means Jehovah, Savior. There's no way they could fully have comprehended that. But when he said, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, well, we can understand. Step out of the way, move on back. Let's stand and see the salvation of Yahweh. In other words, make way for Jesus. Make room for the Lord. Stand back. Don't you try to fight the battle. Come let Jesus fight the battle. What you need to do is call on the name of Jesus and the salvation of the Lord will show up and he will do the work. Oh, praise the Lord. The name of Jesus is in the house tonight. Stand still. Back up. Get out of the way and let Jesus do the work that only he can do. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so the prophetic word went forth. The anointing of the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of the word. What did the people do in response? The Bible says they began to worship. They recognized they were in the presence of the Lord. They recognized they'd heard a word from the Lord. And so they didn't have to wait until the victory was manifest. They began to worship. The peril was just as great. The circumstances was just the same. The armies of the enemy were still marching and amassing together on the border, just like always. But they did not wait until the answer came when they heard the preaching of the word and when they felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When they heard from God, they began to worship. I'm telling you, whatever your circumstance, as the word of God goes forth, if you'll take into your heart and begin to worship tonight, begin to respond to the presence of God, begin to pray when there's the opportunity for prayer, something can happen in the spiritual realm, back at your house or back on your job or at your school, even before you get there, something can begin to happen because as you worship, God begins to do the work. Oh, hallelujah, because the name is here. The name of the Lord is in the house. The name of Jesus. They worshiped. And then they put their faith in action. There is a time to act. So Jehoshaphat gathered his army together, and they began to march. He didn't know exactly how it would happen, so he got ready for any eventuality. They marched forward, but he put worshipers in the the vanguard. And the Bible says they begin to worship. They begin to sing. And they begin to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Think about that. It was quite an unusual army because they had a choir with them. And the choir began to sing. Lord, you're different than all the other gods. You're the holy one. You're the separate one. You have chosen us of all the people of the earth to be dedicated to you. We are the people of the name of Jehovah. We are different from everyone else in the world. We're not better than others, but we have a relationship with the true God. And so we're worshiping the beauty of holiness. We're worshiping God in his splendor as the holy one. There's something about that when God's people begin to worship in the beauty of holiness. There is a commitment and that comes with serving the holy God. And there is a power that comes with that commitment. I've talked to people in past years right here in this assembly who've left. They said we were too strict and they wanted to be involved in different things, and they had to make certain consecrations, and they really weren't ready to make those consecrations. Well, okay, we love you. Keep coming. But if you want to go to the next level, you're going to have to go where, where God has taught us. And I've talked to them. They've gone, and then they will come back. And I'll say, well, why did you come back? We still teach the same thing, and we haven't changed. And they say, but there's a power here. There's a depth here. There's intercessory prayer here. There's something about the worship here. It's no coincidence. A depth of worship, a depth of consecration, a depth of intercessory prayer. Understand this clearly. It's not because you and I are better than anybody else. But when we make a commitment to serve God in the beauty of holiness, God honors that. God's spirit is there. 
We're recognizing his name is in the house. His name is Jesus. His name is holy. Any church that proclaims the name of Jesus in the beauty of holiness can expect miracles, signs, and wonders, deliverance, healing, a depth of worship, a depth of consecration, intercessory prayer. I'm not talking about denominations or organizations, but because the Pentecostal movement has become so accepted in the last 25 years, you'll find many churches will say they're spirit-filled or charismatic or Pentecostal. You'll find many churches that don't even advertise that, but their worship has a beat to it. They'll use drums. They'll clap their hands. They'll raise your hand. Where in times past, if you did that, the usher would tap you on the shoulder and tell you to, to be quiet. Now they will allow that within certain limits. And I'm all, I'm all thankful for that. I've been in some of those services, and I felt the sincerity of the people. But you know what? When you don't really exalt the name of Jesus, when you don't take a clear stand for truth and holiness and righteousness, you can never really go past a certain level. There is a depth of intercessory prayer. And even the people, they like the joyful, exciting worship. But when you start intercessory prayer, it's foreign to them. Or when there's tongues and interpretation, it's foreign to them. But if you've ever been around Pentecost for long, you will know there's some things that don't happen just in the initial worship. Some things happen at the end of the service, maybe even 30 minutes after the end of the service when half the people are gone, but there's some people still praying. There's some things that happen in all-night prayer meetings. There's some people happening, some things happen when, when you have home meetings or when you have Friday night, people coming and going, praying for several hours. Something, you get in a vein of the Spirit. Something happens in the prayer rooms. It doesn't just happen in the shallow initial moment. But when you begin to worship God in the beauty of holiness, there's some things broken in the spirit. The name is in the house. And so as they begin to worship, the Bible says the Lord ambushed the enemy. And evidently he confused them. And he set them at odds as these different armies were marching to meet together and plan their strategy. Somehow they got confused and they began attacking one another. And before it was over with, there was a massive battle where the Lord set the ambush. And these enemies that were trying to join together to fight Judah fought each other and killed each other. And when it was all over, they were defeated and they fled. And Judah was just still standing there waiting to fight. It literally came to pass. If the battle is not yours, but the Lord, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And so the, the, the Jewish people just gathered the spoil of the battle. They had the victory without having to fight. They reaped all the spoils of victory. They went across the field and took all the, the, the weapons, the jewels, the money of these dead soldiers and took them back rejoicing. And when they got back to the city of Jerusalem, guess what they did? They worshiped with joy and thanked God for the victory. Did you notice they worshiped when they heard the word of promise before they, the battle? They worshiped during the battle and they worship after the battle. They gave praise to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now there is a practical example of what God can do. When we call on the name of Jesus in faith, when we call his name in worship, when we call his name in intercessory prayer, when we gather at the end of the service and begin to pray for one another in the name of Jesus, we should expect something to happen. Because Jesus himself promised in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So that means right here, we have the special attention of Jesus. You know, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but this is probably the largest gathering of apostolic Pentecostal people on Sunday night in the Austin metro area right here. We have the name of Jesus working right here in a special way. 
that's unique at this place in this time. The name is in the house. A miracle can take place here in the next few minutes because the name is in the house. And I'll just tell you this, there's power in corporate prayer, whether it's two or three or whether it's two or three hundred or two or three thousand. In the Youth Congress, you heard Brother Shaw mention it, that arena itself uh, sold out 18,000 seats. They probably squeezed in another 500 staff and, and people working around. So that's all it could physically hold, which the, the staff at the venue said they'd never sold out that arena before. That was the biggest crowd they'd ever seen there. And when Friday night, when we all shouted, Brother Stone King said, God wants to give us victory uh, through the shout. When we all raise our voices, they said that was the loudest decibel that's ever been recorded in that arena. It wasn't microphones. It was eighteen to 19,000 young people raising their voice in worship to the name of Jesus. The loudest decibel level ever recorded in that arena was praise to the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, something happens when you call on the name of Jesus. I don't know what all happened because the testimonies are coming in, but I do know in a few minutes' time, the young people gave $270,000 to She's for Christ. That's a miracle. I know at least three of the conference staff. I'm not talking about the ones we brought. I'm talking about the employees. At least three of them received the Holy Ghost. One staff, I think, what, what did he fall out or, or speaking in tongues? And they gathered around. They were afraid, called EMS because they thought one of their staff members was in trouble. It's just the Holy Ghost. Call EMS, one of our members is down. It's called the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. There's power in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. That power is here tonight. There's deliverance tonight. There's victory tonight. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. Your life can change tonight in the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you this, if you are ever by yourself and you need the Lord, remember in the New Testament, the temple is not in Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, your body, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own, you're bought with a price. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, as Acts 2, 38 says, the name has been called over you. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. So while there's multiplied power when two or three gather together, there's multiplied power when two or three pray together. If you are all alone and you have the Holy Ghost and you know the name of Jesus, actually you are not all alone. If you are call on the name of Jesus, you have his presence, you have his attention, you have his power. The name is in the house. There's salvation in the name. Acts 2.21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a quotation from Joel. In Joel's prophecy, whoever calls on the name of Jehovah. But in Peter's application, that Jehovah has become our Jesus. Salvation is in the name. There's healing in the name. I already quoted to you what they said to the lame man in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he was instantly healed. There's deliverance in the name. Whether you're in a in spiritual battle and you're on the defense, Proverbs 18, 10 says the name of the Lord, Jehovah, is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. If you're lying on your bed in the middle of the night and you feel an oppressive attack of the devil, it'd be great to call Brother Shaw and tell him to come over. But I tell you something even better than that. Right there on the spot, you start calling on the name of Jesus. 
You run into the name of the Lord, and you're going to be safe. You are going to be okay. You start calling on the name of Jesus. There's no devil in hell or out of hell that can overcome you when you call on the name of Jesus. You have power over the enemy. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You have the name of Jesus. Even if you're not living for God, which I highly don't recommend, but if you find yourself in trouble, your best hope is to start calling on Jesus. And he'll give you time to repent, but you need to start saying the name of Jesus. That's where your protection is. That's where your hope is. That's where grace is. And when you're on the offense... David, teenager, coming against the professional warrior Goliath, he said, 1 Samuel 17, 45, you come with the professional weapons of warfare, spear. You have the sword. You have the shield. You have everything's needed. He says, all I have is a slingshot and some stones. But he didn't even say that. He said, I come to you in the name of of the Lord of hosts. I come in God's name, the name of Jehovah. I was sent here by Jehovah. I'm not depending on superior weaponry. I'm not superior, depending on superior tactics. I'm not depending on sub- superior ability. I'm coming because the Lord has sent me. I'm coming with the anointing of God's Spirit. I'm coming in the name of the Lord. And if you're coming in the name of the Lord, do not fear, do not doubt. Do not worry. Just keep on going because God will give you the victory. The name of the Lord is with you. Acts 16, 18, Paul was preaching and he encountered a woman who was possessed of a demon. And she started sarcastically or or I don't know what her attitude was, but the people around her no doubt took this. She started saying, listen to him. He's, he's the preacher of the Most High God. Well, you don't really want a demonic spirit endorsing you. That could be the death of your revival. Anybody really seeking God will turn away from you. And so Paul got so aggravated at this evil woman coming, mocking, or trying to sabotage his ministry, he turned around and said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. And the demon came out of her. There's power over demon spirits. And I'm telling you what, you may think that's foreign to Austin, Texas, but it's not. In our church, we've encountered some demonic spirits in the past. And I'll tell you what, it's probably more likely in the future as people openly turn away from God, openly deny God, openly get involved in witchcraft, openly get involved in lifestyles that are contrary to God's Word. It's likely that we'll find more manifestations of that. If that's happened, do not be afraid, do not worry, because we have power in the name of Jesus. You don't have to grab him in a chokehold. You don't have to grab him in a full Nelson. You just stand back and say, in the name of Jesus. If they want to be delivered, you can pray with them until they're delivered. If they don't want to be delivered, they'll have to get out of here because they can't take too much of the name of Jesus. I'm saying we can have revival in Austin, Texas because the name is in the house. I'm here to proclaim right here in New Life Church, the name is in the house. Oh, let's stand right now. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The name is in the house. The name is in the house. The name is in the house. house. I can give you testimony after testimony. But remember when Papa Sykes fell over, I believe, dead of a stroke, we prayed in Jesus' name and the Lord raised him up. 19, what, 95. That's the history of this church. I was sitting in my home, 2007. I had what the doctors later said was a stroke, and then they finally said it wasn't because they couldn't find any sign. But when the symptoms began coming, I laid hands on my own head, and I said, in the name of Jesus. And it went away. I can give you story after story. Brother Trey Rosenblatt, I saw him here this morning. I don't know if he's here tonight, but he wouldn't be here 
Even on a Wednesday night, when I talked to the doctors, they gave him a 10, he was in a coma. He didn't even know what's going on. He had a heart attack. They gave him 10% chance of making it through the night. That was a Wednesday. I told the church it might be God's time to take him. But what if it's not God's time to take him? If we don't pray, he's not going to make it. But if we pray, we can claim a miracle. And sure enough, God brought him out of that coma. He never had another heart attack. And he's here many years later. The name is in the house. The name is in the house. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing power. There's delivering power. There's somebody here. You've been bound by sin, but there is deliverance tonight. There's somebody here. You made some bad choices, but the end is not yet. Your life is not over. God's grace is still here. You say, well, how can I unravel it? I don't know, but the name of Jesus can cut through all those knots. The name of Jesus can cut through all the confusion. The name of Jesus can give you a new beginning. The name of Jesus can wash away your sin. The name of Jesus can restore your life. The name of Jesus can deliver you and the good news is the name is in the house the name is in the house the name is in the house here we are in Jesus name the name is here oh let's praise the Lord together somebody needs to come if you need to forgiveness of sins come on if you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost come on if you need healing come on the name of Jesus is in the house the name of Jesus is in the house the name of Jesus is here